a sign-up opportunity if anyone has musical gifts that they would like to explore for the leadership and renewal of Hope College on the Campus Ministry Worship Team Band. You can sign up this week. Deadline is Friday if you would uh, like to sign up. Um, okay. Good? All right. And if anyone wants to go on a kayak ride with Jerry Root, um, just talk to him personally. All right. Um, our scripture... <laughs> Uh, transition with me. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Genesis, end of chapter 25. It's a story, a small story of two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Friends, hear the word of the Lord. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the fields, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac, his father, loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah, his mother, loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, give me to eat some of that red stuff, for I'm famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? Jacob said, first swear it to me. So he swore it to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. And he drank. And he ate it. And he got up and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a wonderful story. A story of contrast. A story of two brothers, but one complicated relationship. The contrast we hear right away from just the kind of men these people are. You could call one an extrovert, one an introvert. One a contemplative, one a man of action. Esau was a hunter, a skillful hunter, a man of the fields. He liked to be outside and to work with his hands. I imagine his skin was as tan and his muscles were thick. He was his father's favorite, a man's man, you might say. Jacob was just the opposite. He was a quiet man, living in tents, stayed behind with his mom. We get the sense that he has culinary expertise, as if he was on, what's that show, Mighty Chef? Iron, iron Chef. Chef. Yeah, Jacob's an Iron Chef kind of guy. <laughs> Two contrasts of personality and people. One family, one complicated relationship. And the contrast of Jacob and Esau is seen in their relationship between another contrast in the story, how they view the difference between stew and birthright. A stew and a birthright. Their differences in, peop in personhood and personality, but ultimately what was in their heart is represented by how they viewed and valued their birthrights and a sense of stew. Now, a very popular interpretation of this text is to view the stew as something material and the birthright as some spiritual quality that Esau just didn't care about. But that's really a misinterpretation because to understand fully what's going on, you have to understand that the birthright is something material. It's not just a spiritual quality. The birthright has everything to do with one's security, one's identity, one's sense of inheritance that is coming in the form of land and prosperity, but it's not something that they get right now. So the birthright is a very much a material kind of blessing. So I don't want to dichotomize this contrast between a material blessing and a spiritual blessing. I think maybe a more faithful interpretation of this contrast is to see the difference between a deferred and immediate gratification, a deferred blessing and an immediate blessing. 
The stew representing an immediate blessing that will satisfy an actual hunger in the here and now. And the birthright that will satisfy a hunger that is deferred later on. But both of these are a mixture of a spiritual and material blessing. But the difference in the brothers has to do with how they relate to these two blessings. Esau, we get the sense, is that man of action. He lives in the now. His current appetites and hungers drive him for getting the blessing immediately. He can't handle deferment. I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? You want my birthright, brother? Fine, take it. Give me some of that red stuff. Give me some of that stew. I'm hungry right now. Satisfy me right now. You can take my inheritance. I don't care. It doesn't mean anything to me because all that I have and all that I know is what's right in front of me at this moment. And with that kind of mindset, we can trade away that which is most precious, that which is given to us as a gift. Esau was an impatient, impetuous man, a foolish man. And it says at the end that he despised his birthright. And you have to understand that the birthright has everything to do with God's promised covenant through Abraham, passed on to his son Isaac. It would go to the next in line, the oldest son, this birthright. So basically, when it says that Esau despised his birthright, he is actually saying he despises the promises of God that have yet to be fulfilled and that are in deferment. Jacob, the contemplative, the quiet man living in tents. He was shrewd and he was cunning, but he hungered for something more, something that would transcend just his own immediate desires, something that he knew would be an endowment for generations yet to come. He wanted to get in on that covenant blessing, doing so much so that he would manipulate the circumstances. Well, in fact, I don't think he actually manipulates the circumstances here. He just comes out and asks them, right? Sell it to me. Okay. And he sells it to him, and he swears it to him. But Jacob has a sense that this birthright inaugurates him into a life that's larger than himself. And I, we don't have a window into Jacob's soul, and it doesn't give us a, a knowledge of what's actually going on. Maybe it was a selfish desire, but I think that there was a tacit sense that there was something that Jacob wanted to be in on part of this large covenantal promise that is going to echo down the canyons of time, and it echoes to us even today. Jacob had a sense that the birthright was about deferred gratification. Esau had the sense that all that he needed right now was immediate gratification. And I think this highlights the difference between these two brothers. But ultimately, this isn't just a story about two brothers and their relationship. I think this is actually a story also about us and about our relationship, our relationship to God's birthright and covenant promise. And a birthright is a gift. It's not a sense of entitlement. And you might be thinking, well, I don't have a birthright. I wasn't born into a family of privilege and of wealth. I don't have this large endowment. But I could not disagree with you more. Each of us in Christ, by the grace of God, have been inaugurated into a very, very large family. And we have been promised an inheritance, a birthright that is yet to be fully realized. Listen to these words from the Apostle Paul in the opening chapter of Ephesians. He writes this, in Christ we have obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to put our hope on Christ might live for his glory and praise. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. And this is our inheritance for redemption as God's own people. 
to the praise of his glory. We have been given an inheritance to be God's own people. We have been given and entrusted with this gift. We have been marked and sealed with the promised Holy Spirit for those who have believed in the gift of salvation, the word of truth, who is none other than Jesus Christ, who last Sunday we celebrated, was crucified, but rose again from the dead. And this Jesus Christ is still alive. And this Jesus Christ is still speaking. And this Jesus Christ is still pouring out his Holy Spirit. This Jesus Christ is still saving. And he is calling all of us not to give away our birthright, for a pot of stew, not to give away our identity, not to give away what he's given us as a gift for short-term gratification so that we might live in to the deferment of a long-term life and communion with God, which is what we were made for. It is what we were saved for. But that is a hard thing because it is easy to give away our birthright. It is easy to compromise our faith in order to have short-term gains. We can say to ourselves, kind of like Esau, I'm just tired of hearing about this over and over and over again. Dad, I got it. I know that there's a covenant promise. I know that this is my birthright, and I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of the faith. I just want to do what I want to do right now. I'll pick up the faith later on. But when we do that, we give away our birthright just a little bit. It's easy as people of faith to compromise our faith for short-term gains. And it's easy at the same time for institutions of faith to do that. The history of higher education in North America is a story of colleges a lot like Hope College that were endowed with a charter of faith, but over time acquiesced and compromise their faith for short-term gains. Institutions can easily give away their promised faith. And this happens in lots of different ways. It happens when people like me, a, a chaplain or a dean of the chapel or a campus ministry, stops preaching the gospel. It happens when we lower the bar of ministry to just make it a therapeutic, moralistic deism, just a soft, squishy spirituality that has no teeth and no barbs and asks nothing of us and no commitments. That kind of ministry is no Christian ministry at all. It happens when administrations and presidents cave in to external pressures that want to leverage a school's mission and identity for their own agenda. And this happens all the time, trying to buy and steal an identity and an endowment and a birthright of faith so that we might be more culturally palatable. That's one of the ways that a college loses its birthright. It happens when faculty no longer care about the gospel of Jesus Christ and their research and their scholarship is no longer conformed to the patterns of revelation but to the patterns of external forces for their own popularity and prestige. It happens when students in class are no longer free to be able to raise their hand and say, I disagree with you because of your faith. It happens when we as a community want all of the promises and all of the joys and all of the freedoms and benefits of the birthright without any of its confinements or commitments, that we want justice without Jesus in our life, that we want reconciliation without any theology of the cross. These are the ways in which an institution of faith, a person of faith, gives away their birthright in order to be satisfied with a pot of stew. And so, I think this is a story about us. I think this is a story about a call to make sure we don't give away, which was hard given by God to us as a gift. And my friends, you and I are involved in this project we call hope. You and I are involved in a project that says we shall not give away our birthright of faith because we will be a people that will wait upon the Lord. We will be a people who will call out the name of Jesus Christ because his name is the only one that when all is said and done, all things in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow before because at the center of all things 
is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And at the center of all things is God's reconciling love. And we are called to live into the gift of this birthright. Sometimes putting away immediate gratification so that we can live in to the deferment of a long-term life, of life of salvation with God. So I want to invite us, as we end this year, to end strong, to end as people of faith who don't give away what God has given so freely for short-term, immediate gratifications. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that your word still speaks. We thank you that you still call us to remember that we have been given a birthright by your grace and we have access to it by faith in you. I pray for each person here and for this entire campus that you would convert us, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that you would mark us and seal us with the promise and power of your Holy Spirit. And in that, we might be set free to live more faithfully and more courageously and more lovingly into the inheritance that you have given us. We pray for our college that this would be a place that would never, ever give away the birthright of a place to worship you in the context of our learning. We pray this in your name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Go in peace.